In the previous tutorial, we learned how to select objects in a 3D scene using the mouse, and today we're going to use the mouse to move an object across the screen. Okay guys, we're going to continue from where we left off in the previous tutorial on 3D picking, so make sure to watch that first. You can find the link in the video description. For 3D picking, we used Render to Texture and GL Read Pixels to identify the object. In order to move the object, we're going to take on a purely math approach called ray casting. An excellent reference on this is an article by Anton Girdelan, as well as a YouTube video by Thin Matrix. Both resources are linked below. At the end of this video, I'm going to share a few tips for debugging such cases, so make sure to watch until the end. I'm assuming that you are familiar with the entire transformation pipeline from local space all the way to the screen. If you feel that you lack some knowledge about it, then I've also linked a few of my videos that cover the process. So, raycasting. Basically, the idea is that if we have a frost stem that originates from the camera location and oriented along the target vector, then we can shoot a ray, which is simply a vector that starts from the camera and goes into the frost stem. The ray, of course, tracks the movement of the mouse, so, for example, if the mouse cursor is on the leftmost column of pixels, then the ray is aligned with the left plane of the frostum. Once you've got the ray calculated correctly, you can use it for many different applications. In this tutorial, we will learn how to move the object that has been selected when the mouse button was pressed. In a nutshell, we're going to backtrack our way through the pipeline, from the window all the way to world space, which is where the ray will actually be used. Now let's start calculating the ray, and we begin with the mouse cursor position, which is provided by GLFW. At this stage, we're in a 2D coordinate system, which OpenGL calls viewport, that goes from the 0, 0 coordinate at the bottom left-hand corner of the window, all the way to the far end according to the resolution. GLFW actually places the 0, 0 coordinate at the top left, so we will need to handle it. The previous stage in the pipeline before viewport is NDC, or normalized device coordinates, and this is where we're going. The viewport transformation, which we discussed in the Vertex Pipeline Finale video that transforms from NDC to viewport, looks like this. We take the center of the window on the X and Y and add half of the window width or height, multiplied by the NDC coordinate, which goes from minus 1 to 1. It's very easy to solve this equation for the NDC coordinate when the window coordinate is known, and this gives us the first step. The next step is to go from NDC back to view space. In the perspective projection tutorial, we learned that in order to project from view space to NDC, we need to multiply the XY coordinates by the focal length of the camera and divide by the Z coordinate. The focal length is the distance of the projection plane from the camera. We have to place it so that it will intersect the frustum planes at exactly minus 1 and 1, since this is the visible range of NDC space. This of course depends on the field of view angle. When the field of view is smaller, we have to push it further away, and when it is larger, we have to bring it closer to the camera. The focal length is the reciprocal of the tangent of half the field of view angle. So now we can go back to the projection equations and solve them for the x, y, and z in view space. We simply multiply x and y by the z in view space and divide by the focal length. This needs to be a 3D vector, so the z coordinate remains the original view space z, which is unknown at this stage, so we keep it as a variable. However, this isn't very comfy, isn't it? Having a variable in our view space vector? The intuitive way of thinking about it is that there is an infinite number of view space points that are projected on the same location on the projection plane. For each z value, we get a different x and y, but they are still located on the ray that we want to cast into view space. We can easily get rid of the annoying z by dividing the vector by z, right? So our final view space vector is x and y in NDC divided by the focal length and 1 as the z. And of course, we need to take care of the non square window case, so we multiply the y coordinate by the aspect ratio. If you take a look at Anton's implementation, you will see that he performs the NDC to view space transformation a bit differently. He multiplies the NDC vector by the inverse of the projection matrix and sets the view space z to minus 1. This minus 1 is because he's using a right handed coordinate system and I'm on a left handed system. 
The two methods are essentially equivalent and in the source code of the tutorial you will find both so you can choose whichever you like. You should get the same result. Okay, now that we have the view space vector, how are we going to use it? Well, for this demo, my decision in terms of a user interface is to move the selected object on a plane which is perpendicular to the camera target vector. In other words, the object will retain its view space Z coordinate and only the X and Y will track the mouse. Since the view space vector that we calculated has one in its Z coordinate, we just need to scale the entire vector by the view space Z value of the selected object and this will provide us the intersection point of the ray with the Z plane of the object. The full equation of intersecting a ray with a plane is a bit more complex, but in this specific case, scaling by Z will suffice. Of course, we will need the view space position of the object, but this is simple to calculate by multiplying the world space position by the view matrix. But wait, wait, <laughs> don't go anywhere. Our objects are not managed directly in view space. We keep their coordinates in local space and multiply them by the WVP matrix in the vertex shader. The world space position of the object is part of its world space matrix. So it's probably better to continue backtracking from view space to world space and modify the original world space position so that when going to view space the object will end up exactly at the same point that we've just calculated. This is very simple to do. We just need to multiply this view space point by the inverse of the view matrix and this will give us the new location of the object in the world. Alright guys, before we jump to the debugging tips, let me give you a quick overview of the main pieces of the code and you can take a closer look later on. So the main render function still has a picking phase and a render phase. The picking phase is the same, we render the object ID into a texture. In the render phase we detect whether the mouse has just clicked on a new object. This is indicated by this first time flag. As long as you keep the button pressed, we want to continue with the same object. But since this is the first time, we read the pixel info and store the object ID. As we saw earlier, we need the view space position of the object in order to do the intersection of the ray, so we grab the world space position and transform it to view space. We store it as a class member for later. The entire math process is included in the drag the object function, and this is basically a direct implementation of the theory. Transition from window coordinates to NDC, from NDC to view space, intersection of the ray with the object plane in view space, transition from view to world and storing the new world position so that it can be used for the actual render. As you can see, we have two implementations of the transition from NDC to view space. First, we have my, um, uh, let's call it the explicit implementation using the reversed projection equations. And then we have Anton's implementation, which uses the inverse of the projection matrix. Okay, so now for the tips, and I actually have three. Tip number one is to start with a square window. Whenever I have to play with a projection matrix, I always get things working in a square window where the aspect ratio is one. Then, if I switch to a non-square window and things don't work correctly, I know that it probably has something to do with the aspect ratio. It's easier to narrow down the problem this way. Tip number two is to align view space with the world. This means placing the camera at the origin and setting its target vector to be parallel to the z-axis. When you reach view space, you're basically done. You can then move and rotate the camera, and if things don't work, you know that something is broken in the transition from view to world space. And tip number three is to disconnect the camera from the mouse. My default implementation of the camera up until this point moves the camera along with the mouse. But this means that we are rotating the camera while moving the object at the same time, which makes it more complex. The demo of this tutorial starts with the camera being disconnected from the mouse, so you can move using the keyboard and the mouse is used exclusively for controlling the objects. When you click the spacebar, the camera is again connected to the mouse so you can rotate it. You'll see that it's much easier for debugging. Ok guys, that's it for today. If you found this tutorial useful, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.